I ran Boston this past spring, but I didn't do any speed work or anything. I just, could you say that again? Um, I had ran Boston. Oh, I didn't do any speed work. Hi, I'm coach MK founder of the fitness protection program. I'm a run coach, not a life coach. We're never really talking about the running. Running is the tool. It's the conduit we use to examine the world we live in, as well as its impact on our own lives and the lives of the people around us. How we react to certain people and to certain stories tells us a lot about how we view ourselves. I'm committed to the thoughtful, intentional exploration of the importance of running so that no one discounts their own badassery ever. Final note, this podcast is geared towards every runner who won't lose their home, livelihood, or health insurance if they show up to the corral with the hangover. Not that I'm encouraging you to do that, just saying. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the Fitness Protection Podcast. We are super excited to have our first guest on the show, Lindsay Hine. You have definitely heard her podcast. I'll have another with Lindsay Hine. We personally loved her recent interview with Courtney DeWalter. Lindsay is a marathon runner and coach who lives with her husband and four boys in Indianapolis. And I can honestly say that she is just lovely. Lindsay says she likes conversations and she isn't kidding. We forgot all the conventions of interviewing in this one. As soon as we started chatting, our conversation went all over the place, from the joy of four boys to skincare and back around to the original reason we wanted to talk to her in the first place, body shaming. Big thanks to Karen Schluter, by the way, for drawing our attention to her Facebook post. You made this all happen today, Karen, and we could not be more grateful. We hope you enjoy this casual, fun, sprawling conversation with Lindsay Heim and hope you can join us in New York City next month for her live podcast session at the New York Roadrunner headquarters the Friday before the marathon. My background in running is very different than pretty much anyone's. My dad had a heart attack when I was six and I am a morning person. So my mom was like, go run with your father. Get out. Go. <laughs> I'm from rural Tennessee. We didn't have track or cross country. I'd never been on a track till I was in college. So I've been, I've, I'm still running. He's still alive. It's really amazing. But oh, when I talk book. to coaches, it's kind, I'm kind of like, yeah, no, I haven't gotten to the Olympics. No, I have <laughs> run on a team. Yeah. Sorry. I don't know. Um, but w- so when my, when heart rate training kind of came around, but I guess everything I say and do, cause I was, a, I was an investment banker before this, um, <laughs> everything I say and do is just so counterintuitive to yeah. what I think most people hear. Totally. Um, that it's, it's like, whoa. How do you structure your coaching, Lindsay? Do you, do you talk with a lot of people on the phone? Do you have a lot of phone calls about like, here's, you know, you, you got to calm down a little bit. It's going to be okay. Or like, how, how do you, how do you have that boundary with people with, I know you have four kids too, and you have a lot of demands on your time, two podcasts. <laughs> I, well, I only coach about six to nine people at a time okay. and I do all my training on VDOT. Do you guys use VDOT? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. I do that. And so I just keep it really small and I mostly do weekly communication via email. Some people need more handholding than others. Some people are like, I'm good. You gave me your plan. I don't need anything else. Um, I don't do a lot of phone calls, but I always offer it. Usually people are good with just texting. So it's not overly time consuming. I could make it more time consuming if I was more aggressive, but I pretty much let them lead the way as far as how much communication they have with me. And actually... As I've talked to a ton of guests on my show, like who are elite runners, even who are coached by like big time coaches, it Mm. seems like that's a pretty standard model, you know, like Mm -hmm. their coach gives them their workouts. If they need consultation or questions, they can ask, but it's not like this, like constant, like handholding. Yeah. It is very different working with the, what I call super duper sub elites for, because no one, no one knows what a hobby jogger is and an amateur is not the correct application of that word in the running world. Uh Um, And this there's, I I love how the running world has expanded. It's so much bigger than it was in 1996 when I did my first marathon. And I'm just in shock though. It's total. I mean, I'm guessing I'm older than you, but it's all flipped on its head now. Back then, like you didn't, if you wanted to qualify for Boston, you didn't talk about it. You wouldn't be taken seriously by people who showed up at track clubs. Like you couldn't like, Oh, that's really cute. You've given up. Bless your heart. Um, (laughs) So like when I left, I graduated, moved to Hong Kong in 2000. And I love talking to people who 
have been around and know it can be like, yep, and nod like you're doing right now because it's like validation I just don't get. They don't remember a world before Garmin. They don't remember a world before Boston was the thing when that was what everybody talked about and the only thing you could qualify for. And so when I say I've never run it, have you qualified? Well, when I left in stays in 2000, if, if you didn't talk about it, like you wouldn't have any credibility. When I came back in 2007, it was like all anyone could talk about. And I'm like, no, why? And now that I didn't think then I'd become a coach. So now that I am, I'm going to be, it's like <laughs> the one thing I'm going to be hearing about till the day I die. And I'm like, no, I'm still not going to run it. Now it's a thing. <laughs> <laughs> now it's on purpose. Just saying, Boston in April is crap. You live there, Sarah. Come on. I do, yes. And I have been out to cheer for the Boston Marathon many, many years. And I don't think there's been a single year where I didn't feel bad for the runners, either (laughs) because it's too hot or it's too cold or it's raining. Usually it's too hot, though. And like last year, for example, all the spectators were like, what a beautiful day. They're so lucky. Oh my gosh. And, you know, the weather forecast had been for more rain than there turned out to be. And of course, everyone was remembering 2018 Boston, which was freezing cold and so rainy and windy and just like horrible conditions. So the spectators were all going, yay, like they're so lucky. This is great. And the, the, the runners, especially the runners who started later, just had mm-hmm. a horrible time. It got so warm. The, the humidity was really thick because it had rained a little bit and then stopped and it, it it stopped sooner than people thought it would. Um, and it, it, it was so, I think anyone who was watching and not a runner just had a completely different perspective on it. And, and there were a lot of runners that I talked to in the aftermath of that Boston who felt like all they were hearing was, man, you were so lucky. You had such a great day. And they were like, man, I, I really don't feel like I had a great day, but now I feel like I have to pretend that I had a great day. <laughs> and I don't really know how to deal with, with this pressure. That it, it did feel, it felt like there was a lot of pressure to have a certain kind of story about Boston this past year. Um, and I thought that that was really interesting. And so a part of what we, the, the genesis of this conversation with you came from this, this thing that you posted on Facebook over the summer about a day at the track that you had um, when you were out running and, and someone heckled you. And, um, and so there, there are so many things that I, I want to hear you tell about it um, for people who don't remember or, or didn't see that post. But then I'm also, I just think it all comes back to this question of like the, the, the things that make us put pressure on, them, on ourselves and the things that make us feel like, oh, that I, I need to get something out of this. I need to prove something to people by doing this and by having a certain result and by having a certain attitude about that result. Um, and there's, there's just so much going on that I think runners are dealing with that we're not really talking about a lot of the time. Um, so with all of that preamble out of the way, um, would, would you mind, would you mind telling us about that day that you posted about on Facebook and, um, and what that was like? Yeah, for sure. Well, first of all, I did run Boston this year and it was hot at the end. And I, I can I can attest to that. Oh, um, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't know that. I would have tracked you and, and looked no, out for you. It was, yeah, it was hot. Fun. Yeah, it was hot towards the end. I remember thinking, okay, I'm glad I'm going to be done really soon. And I started in a sort of earlier wave. So it was like not super late, but I could mm-hmm. tell like if I was going to be out here another hour, it would be real hot. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a track down the street from my house. And, um, so I headed to the track and I was doing two by 800, one by 1600, two by 800. And I noticed this old man walking around the track and I didn't think he was paying much attention to me, but after my workout, I went to say hello. Like I we kept kind of like walked past him and, um, I, I was saying I'm in this phase of my life where I want to make sure I'm like talking to everybody and saying hello and being a forward person. And my husband would tell you, I've always been like that, but I think I'm more like that now than I used to be even anyway. So I just wanted to ask him about his morning and just be friendly. And then he looked at me and he was like, ask me about my work. he's like, you're told me I was getting a belly on me. I can't remember exactly how he said it, but he told, told me I was getting a belly. And the funny thing about it is, is that I was running in a sports bra And at the time I was like almost one year postpartum and I'm like so confident in what my belly looks like and I'm like proud of it and I just don't care. And I laughed at him because if he actually knew me, he would know that my belly was like shrinking and I had a baby a year ago and like I was actually like 
getting back into the body, like my natural body state. Like it takes me in a full year and that's a full year of like working out regularly, you know, eating right most of the time, but also indulging. And it, it, I've just noticed, and I've had four babies, my last two babies, especially it, it just takes me a year. Like that's just basically when my body is back to where it feels best. And so I was really at the point where I was feeling my very best self. And I was also really proud of that workout. Like I hadn't been doing much speed. I mentioned I trained for, I ran Boston this past spring, but I didn't do any speed work or anything. I just, could you say that again? Um, I had ran Boston. Oh, I didn't do any speed work. Yes. That was the part. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. This was the whole point of the podcast is to hear you say that. I'm just, no, 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 I didn't know you were going to say that. And I appreciate it. I get, um, uh, it's something we hear a lot. I don't, I just don't think we can train without speed work. I'm like, yes, you can. Yeah. Like I've got books of it. Yeah. And I mean, for me with Boston to just talk about that for a second, I, I had, um, my hamstring had been feeling weak, like, you know, six months postpartum, right when I was starting to ramp up my long runs for it. And I went and saw an athletic trainer and got it worked on. And basically it's just the whole glute activation thing. Um, that's why my hamstrings are feeling weak. And I just decided like, this is silly. If speed work irritates that right now, I, I, I might as well get my runs in and be in shape so that I can complete Boston in a healthy way and not worry about that. So yeah, I, I did no speed work for Boston. I just, I ran. I just ran what felt right. Um, but anyway, this summer I did start incorporating some because I like, yeah. like to run fast sometimes. And yeah. um, I was starting to feel, you know, I had run that marathon and I, and I just chilled for a while. I was starting to feel my very best self. And so, you know, I just, I felt like it was comical. And I, I almost feel like, I don't know if, if the right word is privileged that I get to feel like that because I've never had huge body image issues in my life. Um, but that's also something I've been super proactive about most of my life. Um, I've never done any sort of like dieting or watching calories or anything like that because I know it's a slippery slope. And so anyway, I, I said to the guy after his comment, he kind of kept going on too. like after I laughed at him, I said, Hey, um, you know what? I've had four babies and, and like my belly, it, a lot has happened here and I feel really strong right now. Um, and then anyway, after our chat, he kind of went on about me eating salads. Like it was crazy. <laughs> I was like, this is not a real life. And I don't, Whoa. I know, <laughs> I know mm-hmm. I, he's an older man. And I don't know if it was like a cultural or generational thing, but he just wasn't getting it. Um, but then afterwards I asked him to take my picture. <laughs> and so <laughs> I did. And then it's perfect. <laughs> And um, I told him have a good day. I haven't seen him at the track. I haven't been back back to that track much, not for any real reason. Um, But I do think my stomach's gotten smaller since then. And it's not because of him. (laughs) Or or, or because you've been eating salads. No, it's just because it's the natural progression of what my body's done postpartum. Yeah. Yeah. We, I, my daughter's favorite book right now is called Tilly, the Terrible Swede. It's about Tilly Anderson. She was um, one of the first female cyclists in North America. And she was a champion from 1896 until like 1920 when she took up motor car racing. But there's a, they took up, the doctors evaluated her. Um, this is part of the story. They evaluated her and took a picture of her legs. Um, and it, this was published with a study uh, just a photo of her bare legs, which at the time was scandalous in the newspaper. Her mom kicked her out of the house afterwards, um, which is like, and her friends were totally mortified. And the doctors were assuring people that this was a healthy leg. This does not look feminine. It is not aesthetically appealing. There is nothing pleasing about this leg, but it is in fact a healthy leg with lots and lots of muscle that women, it, it's not, they thought, I guess they thought they were doing something progressive at the time. Like it isn't unhealthy for women to have muscle. Um, but my daughter and my son, he wasn't even like really listening to the story. He was like, that's really mean. And my daughter was like, yeah, you, you can't make comments about other people's bodies. Why did, why did they do that? <laughs> and I'm like, I have, this is a hundred years ago, honey, more than a hundred years ago. And I'm, I, it kind of makes me <laughs> happy in these moments. Like, okay, this is less likely to happen in the future. Like they get it. They know you can't comment, but how do you give that memo to anybody else? It's not okay. Yeah. I think part of my message on that post too was like, 
us growing a little bit of a thicker skin too. It's kind of like, I can choose to be offended by that guy's comment, or I can choose to like believe what I believe about myself and let his comment be his comment, be his thought, not my thought. That's his Mm -hmm. thought. You know what I mean? I know that's hard to do and it's, it's probably a lot easier said than done. Um, but actually just last week I was picking up two of my kids from daycare and a mom asked me if I was having another. And I was wow. like, I know. And sh- she did. I, I think I, as, as soon as she said it, she was like, oh, shoot. Um, like I was holding my son in a way and my tank top was tight. And I, I looked down and I was like, OK, I guess I could see how she would think that based on, you know, how I was standing. Your belly has this like little home that you've had all these babies in. And yeah. um, I don't know, like when she said it, I was confused at first. And then I realized why she was saying it. And I, and I almost feel like by retelling it to people that it makes me sound like I might be offended, but I'm just, I'm just not. And I think that's part of what I want to share is just like, we can choose to not be offended by other people's words. Not that she should have said that. Not that that guy should have said that they shouldn't. That's like human, natural human social etiquette. You know, not to Mm -hmm. say those things to people. Um, but you don't have to be hurt by it, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I totally, I totally agree. And I think that it, it's, it's something that do, it takes a lot of work, especially for people who have, who have been hurt by that kind of thing in the past. Totally. When I think for me, when stuff like that happens, it's, it's not that in the moment I'm so offended by this thing that's happening. It's more that it's very like triggering of all of these memories yeah. that I have. I used to, when I was 22 years old and weighed a lot less than I do now, I got asked if I was pregnant all the time by the high school students that I taught. And it, I was not in a good place at that age. I was not in a good place with my body at all. And I felt just, it it felt so oppressive to me. And I try, and I knew that like, I had this, I had this voice in my head saying, well, you shouldn't be offended. You should just, you know, do your thing. And who cares what they say? They're jerks. And they were jerks. (laughs) Um, You know, a lot of high school kids are jerks. I was a jerk when I was a high school kid. But, um, (laughs) But, but that's kind of, it, it's, it always brings me back to those moments whenever, even just the other day, my husband and I got dressed up to go to a wedding and my mother-in-law was taking our picture and I looked at the picture and I was like, uh, can you just take that one more time and let me suck in my stomach, please? Yeah. Because I've actually, I had two miscarriages last fall right around this time. Um, and the, I just, part of it is that I don't want anyone to look at me and ask me if I'm pregnant or if, or anything like along those lines, I just don't want that thought to cross anyone's mind. Cause I'm sort of, I'm protecting myself a little bit from conversations that I'm afraid to have. Totally. And whether that's a great thing to do, I would, I would love to, it is love a great to work thing to do. on that response. You know? Self-care is a great thing, Sarah. It's, it's shaming to live in the shit. There is no, you feel what you feel and that's valid. The only time that we're not, being true to ourselves, even though that sounds like a very vague statement, is when we we give the right answer instead of the true answer. Right. And yeah, protect yourself. So let me let me validate you there. I feel like this is like really what people hire me to do. I've been in therapy since I was 19. That's a long time, y'all. <laughs> you like, put your work is, in. <laughs> put my time in. If I sound like a therapist, it's because I've been with them a lot and I go weekly and I love it. But that's what it's for. It's for validation when you're not getting enough. The, the, the ghosts of bullies past live in here mm-hmm. and they don't go away and you never know when they're going to come back up. So it's really important to know how to protect yourself in the, in those moments because you can't just call the Ghostbusters. Well, that's a good point too. Like that I could have been in a completely different state of mind. Like just what you just mentioned. Like what if I had just had a miscarriage and I was super emotional about that? I might have been like, screw you. I just had a miscarriage. I probably would have just yelled it to him in his face, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, So it's easy for me to preach that. I was in a healthy mind state when he said it. And also I'm 36, not 22. So I think that there's just so much we've, you know, I've learned since that phase in my life as well. I would have been way more offended at 22 than I am at 20 at 36. How do we teach 22 year olds to feel that way? Though I think it's just kind of you grow and you learn and you yeah. go to therapy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
And there's, so there's, there's something, there's a part of me when, when you posted that, and I'm interested to hear about other responses you got to my response oh, yeah. when I saw it. And this was our, one of our people tagged us on that post of yours. So thank you, Karen Schluter. If you're listening, we love you. Um, and, and there was, there was definitely a part of me that looked at you and, and I, I had heard your podcast before and, and knew of you and, um, and then just thought, man, like if Lindsay Hine can't run shirtless at the track and do her, like, <laughs> two by 800 and 1600 and then another two by 800 without some dude like judging her body, then what hope is there for me? Like what, what would that same dude in the millions like him have said to me? Cause I, you know, I, I have, I, I, I have a, a, an instinct to be sort of protective of my body in, in a way that, um, you know, I, I, th- I think about that happening to you and I think, well, that, that kind of means there's no more hope for me. Mm-hmm. But then at the same time, there's something almost comforting about the fact that this th- that none of us are safe from it because it's n- it's not about your body it's not about my body there is no amount of weight i could ever lose and i don't want to and i'm not trying to and that's not my objective at all but that there's there's no body i could have mm-hmm. that would keep me safe from someone deciding to make a comment that might hurt my feelings. And the reason for that is because it was never about me to begin with. You know? Right. And, and this is where I step in with my therapist talk about diet culture and about the forces yeah. and the pressures that we all feel are very real. When we talk about privilege, um, people tend to shut down if they know that they have it, like, oh, she's talking about me. So mm-hmm. I would argue, if, if I talk a lot about fit privilege, right? So when you're not the first person picked for the kickball team, um, and you get, you just start to shudder when you're participating in sports things because people are like, if you just try a little harder and it's like, that's all I got. This is literally <laughs> all I have. What do you want from me? Um, it, it, it can, it really, and that we do that to kids. This is why I, I like, don't put my kids in sports. I'm like, they're going to have to sell me on this later because it, it can be great, but for a whole lot of people, it's really not. Uh, but that's what privilege does. Right. So when we have these conversations to be like, well, Lindsay Hine is, is not shielded from this, right? She's the person who should, what does that mean for the rest of us who feel if you were to, if we were like stacking nesting dolls, Lindsay would be at the top. That's kind of the privilege of the people at the top. Everyone else is screwed. That can be a really dark way to look at the world. And that is unfortunately the message is getting through. Instead, this is where I come in with like, absolutely not. This is where you look around and say, if the, the most privileged aren't shielded, we need change. This mm. needs to stop happening. So I, I, then I, then I sit back and stop preaching about diet culture and health at every size. And you can be healthy at every size and unhealthy at every size. And yeah, you know, sure. there's the, the messages, the message matters. The message really matters. And yeah. I think I'm, I'm hopeful that at some point we will collectively become more responsible for the, for, for the messaging, because that, that guy, my kids are getting a better message now. And that makes me, that makes me personally very happy. Yeah. 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 What kind of responses did you get when you posted that? And I mean, you, so you, I, I really like what you said before about, um, you know, your decision to, to post it and kind of take control of that narrative and, and make it yours. Um, did you, did you feel any conflict about kind of going public with it and having a conversation about it? And, and what kind of responses did you get when you did that? Yeah, no, I mean, I think that most, I think most people were like, oh my gosh, you're so much nicer than I would have been. Like, I would have told that guy, you know, (laughs) what he served or, you know, and I did, and I did have some people who said like, oh, I think they appreciated the perspective that I didn't have to get angry at him and I didn't have to be mad about it for the rest of the day. And I actually, honestly, when I asked him to take my picture, I actually just wanted a picture of the track. So I wanted that picture at the track and I just of my workout because I just wanted to keep my social media game going. You know, you want, you post your workout sometimes you have to have content. Feed that algorithm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if, and if I'm going to tell people about my workout, it's fun to have a real life Insta picture, not some canned created picture from three weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but anyway, afterwards I, I I actually walked an entire lap with this guy afterwards and we just talked. And then, um, when I went home, I thought, I guess I texted my friends first, this, my group text. And I said, Oh my gosh, you won't believe what just happened at the track. And they were like, Oh my gosh, are you kidding me? And so then I ended up posting the picture because I thought I basically, I felt like the response from them felt, 
I don't know. I think they they because they had the same response that this people most people on social media have. Like, I can't believe you were so nice to him. Um, so yeah, it was a mixed response. I'd say 50, 50, 50%. I would have put him in his place, 50%. Oh, how refreshing, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. All the responses that I got directly were, were just straight up fear. If Lindsay yeah. gets this, how can I stay? How, I, I, am I a runner? Can I run just sort of a different sort of, a different sort of spiral? Yeah. Um, it's, you just never know what's going to happen when you, when you start a conversation. It's interesting. Well, sometimes we see p- runners that mm-hmm. might not might perceive themselves to, they might have b- bad body image issues, but like we all look at them and we're like, what are you talking about? Yeah. Like when someone posts a picture and their belly's like sticking out just a little bit and they make sure to point out that their belly's sticking out. And here, most everybody looking is like, what are you talking about? you you look great, you know? And mm-hmm. so I, I've actually like made that an intentional priority that even if there's a picture where my belly's sticking out or something, or I perceive it to be sticking out, I just don't say anything because it's like, that's who I am. That's what my body looks like. And maybe I'm pointing that out, but honestly, in, in the grand scheme of things that could actually make people feel bad about themselves, you know, by, by pointing out saying, I feel like I look bad here. Yes. Um, it's, it's a really fine line because you do want to be honest too on social media. Like I should be able to say, I don't feel comfortable with how I look right now, but yeah. I think, I think in like, I just want to be myself, you know, and mm-hmm. I don't need to point out flaws just so that people know, Hey, I know this is, this is how it looks. You know, people don't need yeah. to know all that. So yeah, I think it's a fine line and and I would intentionally not make a comment, a um, comment about, you know, my belly sticking out or something. Am I making any sense? No, yeah. you are because you're alluding to what's what's called sizeism. And sizeism yeah. is that so fat phobia is the lack of restricted access to things because of your body size. Um, those of us who are smaller and have access to everything, we don't have to worry if we, about if we can get a seat in a restaurant if we will fit in the yeah. seat. If we I left my the the airline lost my luggage, I can I can buy new clothes wherever I am. It's not a big deal. But sizeism is that pressure we all feel to keep those privileges. And it impacts everyone yep. um, more than others because that line between what's acceptably or, or viewed as unacceptable is so unclear and it moves. So there is value in you saying your truth in a moment where you're like, you know what? I don't feel good. I don't feel like I look good, but you know what? I love this dress and and I want to go to this event. So I'm going out anyway, or I don't feel these shorts don't fit the way they used to, but that run felt the way it used to. And I will take that because we, that Mm -hmm. is, that is such a universal experience. So again, this is where privilege works, right? If the fittest person I can, I will probably ever have the chance to speak to is feeling the same thing that I am. Maybe I'm not as far behind as I think I am. Even maybe if it's not she's about way me. ahead in the race. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, I just think and, there's something really beautiful to it. I, I would, I would hope that this never shuts conversations down because yeah, there's, because yeah. you are a human. Yeah, 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 totally. And, and I, you know, so I, I'm really curious to know too about the genesis of your podcast and, and the audience that you sort of have in mind because you, I mean, like you talk to serious, amazing, famous people with, just insane, insane accomplishments in there. Like court, I just listened to your episode with Courtney DeWalter and I loved it. It was so great. She's amazing. And she's so funny. And it wasn't even your first time interviewing her, which was just really <laughs> cool. Um, and you, you have this amazing way of, I think really defining like the, the voice of your podcast. And, and so you, you talk to these people, like they're just people, but you, you don't do that at the expense of like talking about their careers and their accomplishments. Mm. And, Thank you. Um, and, and I haven't, I haven't listened to like your, your earlier episodes as much. And so I'm curious as to like how you built that voice and that kind of way of, of communicating to people. Cause I would guess that a lot of your audience, you probably have famous people who listen to you, but the vast majority of your audience is people like me, um, who are just kind of, they, they, they like your take on these people. They could certainly listen to many different interviews at this point, especially with Courtney DeWalter. Um, but, but I think yours is really special. Thank you. Yeah. I always say, don't go back to the beginning because it's scary. <laughs> <laughs> I'm you sure know. we're going to feel the same way about our, about our early days of our podcast. Too. I already kind of do. Somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, the whole idea of my podcast, it really was like to share the stories of runners 
and athletes, not necessarily elites, but um, it's kind of evolved into, I don't know, maybe 60% elite runners, maybe more than that, maybe closer to 70. But I also still in, interview everyday runners, you know, lots of mother runners that have made their way onto the show. And um, I, I just want to share their stories, you know, and I don't, I, the accomplishments matter and they're important and it's exciting to talk about someone, talk to someone who like just won the Boston Marathon or something like that. But I just want to get to know the person on a deeper level than their running accomplishments. But we we weave a lot of running into it. So um I don't know, as time gone has time has gone on, I've just pitched to whoever I want on the show and sometimes I ask ten times before I get a yes, but uh, it's been really fun evolution and it's been fun to get more comfortable too. I, me- I remember in the very early days, the first few elite runners I had on, like I think Sarah Hall was my first elite runner. It was just Whoa. like so nerve wracking, you know, cause yeah. I didn't know what I, I didn't know what the heck I was doing. You know, I just, yeah. I, you feel like you're a kid going to like career day or something just yeah. making it up as you go. I always love it. Like I always say, we're all winging it. Like mm-hmm. if anybody says they're not, they're lying. You know, they're not doing anything very cool. They're just, you know, punching their clock, whatever that clock is. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah, it's just evolved and I love it. I just, I love getting to know someone and some interviews I'm ultra prepared for and I have tons of notes and some I just completely show up and know that that person's a good conversationalist and we can just have a conversation with two questions prepped. Yeah. No, it's, it's really, it's really great. And, um, I, I did listen to one of your earliest episodes because, uh, they, they promoted it on one? the, another, uh, the Sarah Bone Shea episode oh, Sarah. It was promoted yeah, on another course. mother runner. Yeah. yeah. Um, I lived in Florida at the time and I specifically remember being in my car in a parking garage and like hanging out in the parking garage a few minutes longer so that I could hear the end of it. Um, it's, it, it's really, it's, it's just, it's such a cool thing that you've built and it's so cool to see what it's grown into, um, over Thank time. You. And, um, I, especially now that I, a year ago, I did not think I would be, ha- I, that I would have a podcast, let alone two podcasts. Um, so, so what's it's, the other one? The other one is the morning mantra podcast, which okay. we have had, um, we have, we have explained to many people and, um, it seems like it, we, it, we have, it has a really good following, but when we ask people if they want to do it, they kind of freeze because I think it's a very different concept from a lot of podcasts. And it's totally MK's, MK's baby. She started it about a year ago. Oh, um, cool. And That's awesome. Yeah. Do you want to talk about it, MK? Well, I had two distinct groups that I had been coaching. And mind you, all the coaching was ever supposed to be was just a way to get out of the house with my Irish twins and go talk to grownups. So, yeah. and, and being new to Denver. So when... Um, when life started kind of pulling me in a different direction um, and I started realizing like, what is it they're paying for? It's not a training plan. We're not really talking about the running. Mm-hmm. And I coach one elite um, and that that's kind of enough. It's a lot. That's a lot of work. Um, on top of that, though, everybody else, I'm like, what do you really need from me other than permission and a little validation? And what I didn't appreciate at the time um, was that that not just the confidence, but the verbiage mm-hmm. and a very different perspective on a situation. So they walk yeah. into something and they feel bad. And I'm like, actually, this is how you take that, find the power and it, shove it right back to them. Cause yeah, 20 years therapy. So I, the, it's a micro podcast. There are no more than 10 minutes long. Okay. Um, we publish five days a week and people write wow. in the situations where they might need a mantra to get through it. And uh, the mantras are always short, no more than four words, because when people come up with mantras and, and there's no universal definition. I've looked and looked, there's no, like, this is what it was. And now we have taken it a different direction. It's, it's none of that. Um, people will have a mantra and sometimes they're very long and complicated. Um, when I was, uh, attacked in college and had to see this person over and over, like, I can't be having panic attacks and, you know, passing out, um, you know, getting lunch at the Taco Bell or in the middle of a class. So this is when I started going to therapy and started coming up with mantras. This is what I'm going to cling to and chant in my brain, like a life raft. I'm going to program this voice. that's going to override my fear and anxiety and help me get back at least on top of the situation momentarily. And I still practice them today. So I just started doing that for people. I know you're scared. I know you're worried. I know you're anxious. Let me tell you this. 
Mm, Here you go. Here's the mantra. And I divide. So there is situation by situation. Um, then, mm-hmm. so this is why we never run out and are able to do it. So I do it three days a week. Cause Sarah does Situations it don't stop coming. That so they sure. give you the situation and then you give them a mantra. Okay, mm-hmm. cool. That's awesome. I find the power that they have in the situation. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. That's cool. I love it. Yeah, it was very, and, and I, in the, in the beginning, I found it very hard. I was not doing it twice a week right away. Uh, the first time I did it, it took me like a week to come up with it and then figure it out and get it down to the right length and all the, and, and it was so much work for me because yeah. it's a very, it's a different way to think about, it's a different way to think about using your voice. And I've always been a writer um, much more than a sort of speaker, at least in any, any kind of recorded fashion. So so getting to that part, getting to that part where you have like a forward distillation of a takeaway for a situation or of an anchor. To, I think of it as an anchor. I think of it as like something solid and concrete that you can hold on to if you're in the situation and you just need a little bit of help. Um, and that it took a lot of work for me to get to a point where I could really f- like distill it into that substance and then make it into a podcast episode. And now I feel like they kind of come to me all the time. Um, and when I find myself, I, I've started to use, I've, I've started to use the podcast almost for myself in, in a lot of ways that I never would have expected in part, you know, working with MK does that to you. Um, but also <laughs> because it is, it's a very effective way of like looking at a situation that recognizing that you're having a hard time with someone and say, then saying, okay, where's, where is my strength here? What can I draw on and how can I deploy it and turn this around and make it more mine? And I, and I sort of think of, the, the day of the track that you posted about, mm-hmm. you know, what you did there, just saying, like, really taking control of that and deciding that you, that you did not need to feel bad about this. You did not need to make this about you. You understood or you were able to understand in, in the immediate aftermath, if not in the moment, that that wasn't about you. And you turned around, you made that guy take a picture of you. <laughs> it, like that, I, I just love that. And, and it's funny that you, that you told that part of the story because I was trying to remember, I remembered <laughs> yeah. the picture from the Facebook post. I was like, it wasn't a selfie. I know it wasn't a no. selfie. It was a full bod she, shot. It was a full bod <laughs> shot. And the reason was that you had that guy yeah. take the picture for you. Yeah. That's like, there was that's like the perfect match right there. Like take the picture, you know, take a take picture, the picture. hand in the phone, right. be like, Oh really? You you think I need to eat salad? Take a Take picture. Take a picture. Yeah. <laughs> and by the way, I like salad. I usually put a lot of dressing and cheese. Yeah, in salad, salad's great. <laughs> but salad's I love great. it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. I think it's true to that day. It's like I was kind of on this like uh, staircase to feeling my best self again, and so yeah. I feel like I could have either let that like shut me down. And be like, oh, what do you think you're doing? Like, you're not back to where you were. But like, I knew how I felt. Like, I, I, it's like an intuitive thing. It's like, you know, you feel like your body is where it needs to be right now. You know, you're sleeping how you need to sleep. You know, you're eating well. You know, you're not, you know, restricting or overindulging. I mean, like, nobody feels good when they eat like crap. I mean, that's mm-hmm. just science. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and I was working out, you know, what felt right. And to me, I usually feel good if I work out five or six days a week, nothing crazy, but like that's, that Mm -hmm. is where my body feels good. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's all just intuitive and some people might feel good working out four days a week for me. It's five, six. I mean, Mm -hmm. we're all different, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Is there, I know you've been running for a really long time. You, you ran cross country when you were a kid. Do you feel like, do you feel like you've been through different sort of phases of, of your running self? Do you think you, that there was a lot of work involved in kind of getting you to that place where you could turn around to that guy and say, yeah, take a picture of me or yeah. do you, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that for me personally, the more babies I have, the more confident in my body I get. Cause like, I know what I've been through and I'm just like, you don't know till you know, you know, I, I think that my confidence in my body is way higher now than it was when I, before I had kids, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I've, I've, I've run since I was 15. I've done 15 marathons and I've just kind of like, it's always been a part of my life. Like it's just a consistency. And I do think for both physical and mental health, I it's, 
a necessary component of my life. Now I know that if running got taken away, I would have to replace that with something else like swimming or something, but right now it works. So Mm -hmm. yeah, I I know that even, you know, an example is yesterday. I, I really didn't feel like running, but I was grouchy and I knew that if I just ran for 30 minutes, my day would be better. And so that had nothing to do with my body. It's just, it was all mental, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, but I do think the older I get, the healthier place I'm in with my body. But the crazy thing is now that I'm not, I'm 36. So then I'm like, can we just be where we are for right now? You know, like I don't need to feel like I need to look any younger. I don't, you know, and I don't feel like that right now, but I hope in 10 years, I don't feel like that, you know, but everybody, you know, it's just a culture thing. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's almost like I'm in this really healthy age and place right now. And I hope it doesn't go away, but I can't yeah. predict everything. So let me tell you about 41. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> it is so great. I've said, we've talked about this a couple of podcasts ago. I, I started this like 10, it started as a 10 step skincare routine. Like it, and it was a very, and now how many steps is it MK? How many steps oh, are there it's now? Like, it's like 36. Do you really do it? But, when, but it's not. It's not out of fear of getting old. It just feels good. It's, it's so good, and I've never done it before. I didn't feel free to in my twenties because you can't act like you care too much. Uh, and I, okay. I, I would exfoliate and I use sunscreen and like I did the bare minimum to like not look horrible. But yeah. I would never would have admitted out loud like I have a very elaborate beauty r- r- routine. Like I couldn't have. I, I didn't feel like that was, would have been received or acceptable or would have been okay. Now at 41, I'm like, yeah, I do. I take care of myself and it's so great. And, it looks and I wish good. I thank, looks great. Thank you. Thank you. I put a lot of time into it. So it is, I'm glad to know it's, it looks really good. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Very clear. And yeah. Yeah. Meanwhile, so everywhere you- I go, people tell me I look tired. So maybe, <laughs> maybe I got, <laughs> I'm only 33, but maybe I got to stop doing the bare minimum one of these days. <laughs> well, it's just, it's when it's, it's finding when you, when, when step one is a game changer and step two makes sense, like, cause you would never go from zero to 10 in one, in one shot. I, I, even mm-hmm. I had never bought a whole kit at once. It was like, mm-hmm. that's good. This is better. If this works really well, if with, oh, rabbit hole, but this is what happens when you get your roof replaced and there's, and you've just had abdominal surgery and you're lying on your couch with no TV. Well, I guess I'll try YouTube because I'm on painkillers and I can't think good. And somehow I got to a skincare influencer and yeah. So, but that's she the great thing. You. <laughs> it, was, it was John Van Ness from Queer Eye. Mm. talking about the double cleanse i'm like mm. yes anyway put the but step, step instructions i'll do it yeah yeah and when you're when it. you're trapped in Where bed do I get that info? <laughs> <laughs> I, I can put it in the show notes put it in the show notes i was just gonna say i would rather somebody tell me i need to lose my belly than tell me i look tired to be honest don't tell me i look tired but it's like i don't understand thing. why people yeah i i don't understand why people want that is to say like that the to worst me. thing like they just no mm-mm. no it's that. not nice. Screw body image don't tell me i looked tired <laughs> <laughs> because what are the chances that it's helping if indeed right. i am tired not like what are the chances more, right. not tired not, right yeah. right <laughs> That's the other good thing about like, again, not to, not to keep plugging it. There is never ever, and maybe it's a function of age. Maybe it's a function of the the thing. But when I say I've started doing the skincare thing, I always get the same response, which I love and appreciate. I have never gotten that immediate validation in mm-hmm. any other area of my life. I started learning foreign mm-hmm. language, which one? Oh, oh, or like, yeah, that don't sound good. Or I just started this diet. It doesn't show, you know, it's never there's never been this, that immediate yes, that really made all the work worth it. So it felt like, what do I have to do to get the validation to make all the work? And for a lot of people, that's what running is. Like if I get this finish time, I will be, if I get here, if Mm -hmm. I look like this, then it'll all, you know, just do skincare, man. Start there. I am in. I I will look up. When is this episode? I'm dying for the show. I really want to see it. <laughs> it's not an episode on, on the show. It's a YouTube video of him demonstrating. And what it's the called what? Is for. The devil cleanse. Double, double cleanse. Double yeah, cleanse. Yeah, you cleanse. You cleanse first with an oil. Okay. And then so there are these two girls that left L'Oreal. They it's called Chem- Chemist Confessions. They okay. were like, 
when you take a look at what the American skincare market wants, they want your mm-hmm. skin. They don't trust that their skin is clean unless it's tight. And mm-hmm. that's the opposite of what you want. You've stripped it of everything that it needs. So mm-hmm. this is what we do abroad and it can't be sold here because y'all don't want it. And this was the next video that YouTube recommended after John Von Ness had demonstrated <laughs> a double cleanse. So now I've got a chemist reaffirming what I just, yep. two of them. I mean, so, chemists yep. are smart. Chemistry's hard. Science, and yep. they're, yeah. And I'm like, well, I don't want to do what Americans do. I want to do what you do. Let's go this way down the rabbit <laughs> hole. So yeah, it, but it all started with you clean your face with oil, which makes no sense. Okay. Um, and then you clean the oil off with an oil, a water-based cleanser. Then you tone that. And that's when it can just like, if you just do nothing but double cleanse three days later, I was back at Target. Like, what else can I buy? <laughs> what else can I add to this routine? I've heard that argon oil is good to clean makeup off. Is it argon oil? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. I thought, I thought makeup. from Trader Joe's. It's not expensive from Trader Joe's mm-hmm. at least. There's um, no piece in any of the steps that is expensive. Some can But be. it's just all it adds up because there's so many steps. Yeah. yeah. With a 10 step, each step might be like six bucks. I can do that. I can handle that. It's not, the, it's not, not as expensive as my mortgage. So, and some of those products right. are, I mean, seriously, yeah. like if yeah. you go, go all in with beauty counter or something like that, it is not cheap. Mm-mm. And it's so mm-hmm. hard to know like where the value is and whether, because there, there's, we have these instincts to think that like, if something's priced too low, that it must not be good. Yeah. And therefore like, should I want the price higher thing? And it's, it's very, like, I feel this is probably part of the reason why I just, I have my one cleanser and that's all I do. And it's from CBS. Like, I don't, I, I, I look at all of the choices and I just freeze so and don't. It's overwhelming. It's overwhelming. And it's really, I, the areas of my life where I feel kind of most at, at ease and at peace with where I am like running is that's where like, I, I don't, I don't really have a whole lot of things to choose from. I have my, I have my way of training. I have my training plan. That's what we, in our programs, we give people monthly training plans. And that's part of why we do that is because they want to be doing something in between races, but they need a little bit of structure because otherwise, you know, training plans are everywhere. It's kind it's hard to know like, which is the good one, which is the right one, how, what's right for me. And the ability to kind of say, here are some good guidelines for making good choices. That's what I don't have in skincare and what I do have in running. And I'm very thankful for But, but, um, every time I hear MK talk about it, I get a little bit closer to wanting to go get a, some sort of a double cleanse regimen and nail it down. So maybe this will really, I'm, yeah, <laughs> get me on board. I, that's a fun thing about getting older though. It's the permission to do the thing you wouldn't have been comfortable doing caring in your twenties. Mm-hmm. It can, and it yes. has nothing to do with aging or fear, or I look in the mirror and I know I got to fight it. This isn't a battle. Mm-hmm. It's, yeah. to- it's it's just good. fun. Yeah. 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 I slept two yeah, hours last night. <laughs> two <laughs> hours? <laughs> How? Oh How are you God. alive right now? I mean, were I got you, all kinds of kids. Did you have I insomnia? Had, no, no. My children were scared of something. I don't know what they decided that there was a ghost and one got in my bed <laughs> and then the other one got in my bed and my husband travels. So it's like, you know, You're what am I going to do? Yeah. 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 So, <gasps> oh, and knock sleep. on, yeah, knock on wood. My kids have been really good with sleep for like three months right now. It's like probably the best I've slept in, you know, I don't know. I have, I have four, seven and under, but you know, when you have the one, two. Mm-hmm. yeah, when you have the one, you get it, he gets into a routine, he or she gets into a routine where they're sleeping good at like however age. So you have some time until you have your second. But after the second came until about, three months ago, it's been real crazy. And I don't, I'm scared to say it. Maybe I shouldn't have said it, but everybody's doing pretty good right now. Um, but two hours good for you. <laughs> yeah. That skincare too. routine's really working for you on that two hour. <laughs> <laughs> when you said that your eyes look tired. I'm like, there's a solution for that. <laughs> you know what I just do? I don't, I don't have anything, any special soap. I literally just hope that I have to shower at the end of the day. And that's when I clean my face. And if not, I, sometimes I don't even clean it. Or I just take a, literally take a washcloth and wipe it off with nothing. And oh my God, I, I feel so seen right now. <laughs> either I, either like I haven't, ju- I just haven't put makeup on for the day or I just sleep on my gross makeup face. It's so bad. And then... You know, I never wear a lot of makeup, but yeah, it's not good. It's not good for my skin. I know it. That's probably why the next time someone asks me if I'm tired, that's why. 
Well, you know, what, what needs to happen is that we have this conversation with Erin Strout of Women's Running, who, I don't know if you follow her on Twitter. Yeah. She lives on the same floor in the same apartment building as John Van Ness, the skincare, everything. Now, I'm sure he does not want us knocking on his door, but I'm like, is she, she's right there. Yeah, we're going to need to I help thought that was the other, I thought that that's the other woman, the other writer, not Aaron Strout retweeted that tweet, but it was actually- Lindsay Krause, maybe? Is Lindsay Krause. Yes, Lindsay yes, Krause. yes, Lindsay yes, Krause. Sorry, yes. She's the one who lives in the same building as Jonathan Van Ness. And I remember that tweet and you retweeted it and Aaron oh, Strout died. also retweeted it. <laughs> I feel like that must be a fancy building to live in. Well, she, I don't think she knew who he was. Like, oh, it must be some <laughs> YouTube influencer. Oh, that's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> this, this is, this is what, the, like, this is, I saw MK's Twitter is curated very carefully and Jonathan Van Ness will always be right there. If anyone's right talking about top. him, she's on it, on it, on it. <laughs> well, honestly, if, if someone just tells me as long as it's not astronomical in price, if someone just tells me exactly what to buy and I don't have to think about it, do any research, I will just buy it, you know? Yep. And so if I can look at your skin and that is what I'm going to get, that clearness, then I'm just going to buy it. As, and I just trust that based on what I know about you as a person, that it's not going to be too expensive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I don't make any money off of it. I never yeah. like our, our yeah. revenue comes elsewhere and that's always intentional. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We're, okay. All right. These are going to be good in. show notes. So excited. <laughs> but you should in the show notes, you should, if it's Amazon, put your affiliate thing yep. in there. So oh, I don't have one. I don't want well, that. Should. Again, I don't trust it. When people do it, then no, I'm like, okay, are you playing to your audience or are you playing to your wallet? So no, that's true. I'll just do say what really- I like. Do you really like that skincare? Not, I know, but mm-hmm. I can look at your face yeah. and say that you do. Yeah. Thank y'all. I've only been doing this for about eight, not that long. When did I have my surgery, Sarah? Eight weeks ago? Uh, July, was right? Was it yeah, July? July? Yeah, July 2nd. Mm-hmm. So, and it was like a drug fueled haze from like the second till so three months. Really much cooler yeah. than it actually was. It was just, <laughs> it was just like the 12 days. Yeah. So about maybe three months, maybe 12 weeks. Oh, so, well, okay. when you, when you two see each other at the New York city marathon, which I hope you will. Oh, will we see each other? Oh, are you running it? Yeah. So I am, I actually am running, which I'm not. I'm a little bit ill prepared, but I'm doing a. But you're interviewing someone, right? Yeah, I'm doing a live podcast with um, three moms: Sarah Hall, Kellen Taylor, and Roberta Groner. So, Fun. are you running? Are you running? Yes, it's my favorite marathon. I've run it oh, multiple times. Never, I try to. Yeah, I've never run it. Oh, it's I, the best. If you I've would like the once, course, the, the, the Coach MK course report. I get, I get really, this is one of the things I do with my runners. I'm very like detailed and like what you do. If you want the Coach MK experience from a course report for my favorite race in the whole wide world, I would love to give it to you. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a document. It's a, it's a significant document, but it, I think, so I've, I've run New York city <laughs> once. I ran it in 2007 when I was in college and yeah, reading it, 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 your, your course report NK just like captures all of my memories up in it. Like I read it and I'm just there again. And truly it was one of the best days of my life. And I, I did not have a lot of great uh-huh. races in those days. I always felt a ton of pressure. I was terrified that I was not even going to start that race, let alone finish it. And I had the best day ever because it is magical. It just really is. So I'm very excited for you doing it for your first time. Oh, there is nothing, nothing, nothing like it from a crowd control standpoint to a logistic standpoint. Mm-hmm. I, just, I mean, it is epic what they do. I love it. Yeah. Wow. I'm so excited. Too. I mean, the Hills are going to eat me alive. I'm, I'm not real prepared for any of that, but I know that I can gut it out regardless. So it's yeah. just knowing what which ones say? to gut out. If you, if you don't gut out Verrazano at all, everyone Where's does at uh, the very the first, first one. one. Yeah. People go you out sh- too hard. Sh- you mean? Oh, yeah. I, mean, I won't. I, people, it's hard not to, because you're really like, is. oh my God, you know, the the helicopters overhead and the the men elite, the, the elite men start at the same time as like the whole big field. And the year that I ran it, Lance Armstrong was running it. It was a big freaking deal. And oh, like, yeah. I remember fe- there was, it's so exciting and you've been waiting forever. You just want to like, go, 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 go. But that is definitely when you have to be like, okay, I need to fight all Is that mile right one? Now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure I'll go faster than I would. Because of the crowd, you know, um, totally. I had that in, in Boston this year. I had this, it's opposite experiences like mm-hmm. that, you know, 
straight down. And you can only slow yourself down so much because like mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you don't want to put so much more effort forth to slow down. You just kind of want to do what your body's naturally telling you to do. I, you know, I got a little bit, I don't want to say nervous today when I was thinking about it. Cause I, I like just figured out that I was running and, um, I haven't done too many long runs and I was thinking about how hard it's going to be. But then I remembered exactly what you were just saying. Oh yeah, Lindsay, you're not just going out and running 26 miles. Like you're doing it at the New York City Marathon. <laughs> it's a little bit different than just going out down the street and doing it yourself. So yeah. just that atmosphere is going to be super. It's just oh, going to make make it. And you know, you know, and know I mean, you've like, had a lot of experience. You know, yeah. there are no easy marathons in your no. life. <laughs> we were just talking about this last night on our Ask, our, our oh, Q&A podcast. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to yeah. be real hard. <laughs> the only piece I, of advice I would give that you might not hear elsewhere is what, um, what I call the optical illusion that comes at the 63rd Street Bridge. You're okay. going over Roosevelt Island and everyone makes the same mistakes on this bridge. Unless you, I mean, even me, and I lived in New York and ran that bridge as as, as training runs in the moment in the crowds when you can't quite see your so that bridge takes you over roosevelt island okay. and uh, the nature of an island you got a body of water on each side of it so you come up and you look down and you see water and you see water and then you see land and you're like oh i'm almost at the end but you're not you're not oh, until okay. you see the second body of water okay and you're and going from up. the angle mm-hmm, and from the angle you can't see land Right. So by the time you finally do, you, you don't, you haven't seen the entirety of the island. That's a teeny tiny mm-hmm. island, but that bridge is two miles start to finish. Oh, so you're going and uphill I, for two, two miles. You're, you're going uphill for one mile, but okay. you, and then you, you want that mile to be over so badly okay. that you're a quarter of a mile into it thinking, I'm almost at the top. And you're not. So when you, you see that second body of water, miles. you'll get a peak of that second body of water right before you crest and start the down. What mile so that is would, that? Uh, 16, 17, sorry, 15, 16. Oh, mm-hmm. that's really when things start and happening. Then you, okay. And then first Avenue. Go. Yeah. Yeah. Come, and I, then that, where's that? What mile is that? Uh, 18, 19, 20. Yeah. Okay. I, I do think though, I, I remember that the the first part of that bridge being really tough, but as you crest it and you start to come down the year that I did it, there was a sign that said, if 10 miles to go is easy, then welcome to easy. Welcome mm. to Manhattan. And then it just spit And then like, and, and it was like one sign and then the next sign and the next sign it just spit us out onto first Avenue and the crowds on first Avenue are crazy. Oh, and, it, wow. and I like, I, I still like cry when I think about it. I love it. <laughs> It's so amazing. It's I'm so excited for you. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to think right now. I should wear a really bright color. I, I'm never the person that wears a bright colored shirt or like puts my name on anything. I'm like, I'll be the one in all black and a hat. So I'm really hard to spot. And for no real reason, like in Boston, I did it because that's just like all that I had that fit me at the time. And I was like, not going to go buy new clothes. And so I think this time I'm going to try to wear something that's noticeable. So people can spot me because it's so encouraging when people actually say your name and cheer yes. for you. And mm-hmm. lots of people in New York do that. If, as, yes. as I remember, a lot of people had their names on their backs. Oh, had the their names. And, yeah. I got to yeah. do something. I'm going to do something that's like defining so that it's easy to catch for sure. I love it. Oh boy. I love it. Well, let me know when your podcast recording oh, is. I'd yeah. love to be there. Like yes. we love, um, when are you Kellen Taylor? I'll be, I usually come the Wednesday before. Oh, you're really- like, I negotiated this hard in my, with my dowry when I got married. I was like, yeah, this this is is what I do. When Uh I go, I'm out for a week. Uh Uh-huh. Awesome. And he does all of the kids stuff. You take any kids. You don't take any kids. That's awesome. No, no, no. (laughs) I'm I'm like you four and four under seven, no twins. Like when I'm with them, I'm not mom. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome that you give yourself that whole week. Um, it's on Friday. It's the Friday before the race, obviously at 1 PM at the run center at New York road runner. So, cool. um, I'll post about it though. Yeah. So definitely come if you can, it's going to be really fun. Totally. Oh, and we'd so like excited. to congratulate Rebecca, uh, Rebecca Groner on her big in Doha. Oh my God. She's amazing. She's oh. so amazing. All, and then Sarah yeah. Hall's having all these like awesome races. How? How? I don't How know. is it humanly possible? She, if anybody can serial race, it's her. I mean, it's it's crazy. I love that it's happening against the backdrop of Salazar finally being sort of publicly uh-huh. outed. Like uh-huh. you can do this the right way. You can because we know because mm-hmm. Lord knows Sarah Hall is doing it the right way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. 
That's, I just wish the so, timing I of the think... news cycle had been a little bit different so we could have talked about it. I know, celebrating that more. Yeah. But at the same time, I think the importance of that juxtaposition can't be overstated. I'm so, yeah. no one deserves it more. She's so happy for her. It's so great. I'm yeah. so excited to see what all three of them do in New York. That's going to be an amazing podcast. Have so much fun with that. Thank you. I know I'm like, I was already excited about it. And then Sarah and Roberta both had these like phenomenal weekends two weekends ago. And I was like, well, this just made it even more exciting. Yeah. Did you envision this sort of thing happening when you started your podcast? No, I like, I had Christine Burke, who is the vice president, I believe at the Roadrunners. Her PR people pitched me to come on my show. And I looked at the email and I was like, okay, I don't know. And then I showed my husband the email and, you know, you get, I get PR pitches a lot. And a lot of times I just scan them over, but, um, I showed my husband this one and he was like, you definitely need to have this woman on your show. I'm like, okay, if you're all in, like if usually if, if he gives me a really strong vote of confidence, I take that as a sign that like he really believes in it. So anyway, I had her on the show and she was wonderful and great. And at the end of the conversation, I just said, Hey, you know, I would really love to come out to New York for the marathon and do like a live podcast or something with you guys sometime. And I just, I said it during the live, rec- the recording of our show. Cause I just thought, you know what, just put it out there. Just put your goals out there, Lindsay. And she emailed me afterwards, you know, I emailed her, said, thank you. She went back and she said, we'd love to make this happen. And it, it happened. And so wow. I, I really went all in last year and they, they, set me up with Paula Ratcliffe, which I was like, Oh my gosh, this is crazy. And I was two months postpartum. So you know how that is. Like I was not in a totally like great mental state, but I was like, I'm doing this. Um, and so now this will be my fourth show with them. And so I know it's just like, what if I, I felt the urge to say that during her interview Mm-hmm. Even though it could have made me feel foolish if she would have been like, ha ha, or, you know, just not entertained it. <laughs> not that she would have said ha ha, but like, you know, she could right. have just been like, okay, sure, whatever. But anyway, I'm so glad I did and didn't care about feeling foolish. That's another thing about being 36. I probably would have been too scared to say that at 22 or mm-hmm. 25 or 27. But um, yeah, it's it's really exciting. And it's it's really an honor too, to be able to to do that. Kind of makes me excited about 52. Yeah. When I'm 64, guess what, y'all? I'm going to have a lot of balls. <laughs> I don't yeah. know if that's the way to say it. <laughs> and no I'll be in the left. air making money for us, doing fun stuff. Yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah. Well, yeah, the older you get, the less you kind of care for that. Any kind of approval or just... And you don't... You learn to not say sorry for asking or just being, mm-hmm. you know. I always want... Whenever I have like... um someone younger than me working on a project with me or even like someone through a sponsor or something that starts their email off with an apology. I'm always, I always want to hold their hand and be like, don't do that. (laughs) Don't apologize to me the second you email me because that right there is already telling me that you're not confident, you know? Yeah. So, but that's, I mean, that was me when I was a young professional. So Mm -hmm. we learned. It was me too. Shocking. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh me God. too. And, and still is, it's still like the thing that I, that I feel like I'm always working on the most. It uh-huh. is so hard. Uh-huh. It's so hard not to say sorry all the time. Mm-hmm. And well, it's it because you don't those, want to say yeah. consequences. Yeah. yeah. You want to say it if it's necessary because you don't want to be an asshole, but of course. And then, <laughs> and, and, it, and it's sort of the, the instincts, like they come and go with different moods. So like if I'm having a really good day and things are really going well, and I, and I'm in a period where I generally feel like things are going well, I don't feel like I need to apologize all the time. But if I'm having a day where I just am really down about something and I haven't quite like sat with it enough to really even identify mm-hmm. it or understand that it's happening, but I just find myself constantly saying like, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Like needing to justify everything all the time. And totally course, smiling and nodding. She, she, she identifies it before I do <laughs> usually. She's like, are you having a day where what's going on here? <laughs> like, like it's all good. It's all yeah. good. Your job is not going to go out by the wayside. Well, I mean, Cause it's for a lot of people, it's really, really real. And particularly sure. Sarah coming out of academia, I feel like there's a, a D de, a decompression period where when mm-hmm. I say this can wait, I'm not saying, show me how much you care. And when I say we can do this tomorrow, just don't let me forget. I mean, exactly that because so very few people, and I get that it's 
um, the, the difficulty of being getting used to being around me a lot is that I say pretty much exactly what I mean all the time. There, there are no lines to read between, but Mm -hmm. if you aren't used to that, you're still looking for what am I really, what the meaning is. And it can, it's, it's like, you don't need that coping mechanism here. Stop it. You're good. Totally. I I said, tomorrow means tomorrow and and I will forget. (laughs) <laughs> that doesn't mean it wasn't important. It was like, this is your job. Yeah. So it's, but it's good. It's good. And it's freeing. And these are also things I wouldn't have been able to enjoy when I was 22 or even 32 either. So yeah, bring it on. 42 is going to be amazing. Yeah, I know. <sighs> totally. I'm ready. <laughs> I always said when I, when I was in my twenties, I always said that I wished I was 30. I felt so ready to be done with certain things about being a 20 yeah. something. And part of it was that part of it was feeling like I needed to exhibit a certain amount, a certain amount of physical attractiveness. That's kind of expected mm-hmm. of women in their twenties, yeah. but I needed to act like it just, it, it just came naturally and I didn't care about it. And that particular double pressure um, was, was really hard. And so I, I frequently said that I felt like I had been 30 for years and I really just wanted to get there already. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and now that I'm 33, I'm like, Oh yeah, this is actually way better. There's more. You're saying there's uh-huh. more. And yep. apparently there's more. This better? is what I hear. <laughs> Are you taking, sorry, not, not to tangent. My brain was still stuck on it. Cause I'm thinking about the weekend Sarah had traveling with her, with her daughter. Are you taking oh your God. four with you to New York? No, no. no. Yeah, I'm going. See, Sarah, I, you you yeah. can leave them sometimes. It's a good thing. Oh yeah, I was just there. Like, I did. Yeah. <laughs> my daughter's still in Washington D.C. <laughs> with my husband, and I'm here. <laughs> nice, <laughs> nice. Yes, it is really nice. It doesn't happen very often, but no. when it does, I do. I travel with my daughter a lot, um, and she really likes traveling. And she kind of often is her best self when she's traveling. She kind of, she becomes more flexible oh, and nice. kind of adventurous. It is nice. It's I and I, I like to collect a lot of stress and like trying to remember all the things. And I usually I'm remembering all the things for her, and I forget the things for me. Uh-huh. That happens every trip. I left my favorite dress in a closet in a hotel room in New York City last week, and I'm very upset. About oh, it. that is but, sad. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. But then it just, I, I, I'm starting to finally like exhale the exhale of, oh, I'm in my house by myself. And um, it's the, wonderful. I'm, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad that you get to go to New York on your own too. That sounds like yeah. a really good time for that. For sure. Is your husband coming with you? No, he's, he's, well, that's the thing about having four kids is it's real yeah. hard to find childcare. Like it's like yeah. one or two, there are people that will step up, but four, yeah. nobody's, nobody's taking four. So like, yeah. usually I, if my mom is available, she just now started taking the third with the okay. older two. She won't do the baby, which I would never ask her to. Um, so you're still like, even if you have my mom taking the big three, we still have to pay for a babysitter for the fourth one. So it's like, I know it's just, yeah, and then it's just figuring it all out is just mm-hmm. so much. Cause when, when did he go? He came with me. Oh no. Even I was in New York like four weeks ago and he didn't come with me, but still figuring out the child care while, like while he was at work and stuff. And mm-hmm. um, yeah. So I, I do think that when my youngest is like three or four, I think my mom will take them all, which is like, okay, Lindsay, stop having kids now. <laughs> but you know what You're, if she won't do, do you can the older yeah. the oldest will be old enough to have friends yeah. and sleepovers that's true that's true too yeah Spread it yeah, out. Far yeah. Out. Uh, totally yeah totally so i mean i get why yeah so i it's just more work so in february we're probably going to do a trip together the two of us uh for another race and and we'll like i'm already starting to figure out you know child care Tucson? stuff um, no, I always go to the Donna Marathon. It's um every oh, okay. February in Jacksonville, Florida. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I do I do stuff with them. It's um they're they are a uh they raise money for the Donna Foundation, which helps people going through treatment for breast cancer. So yeah, it's a it's a cool organization. And I this will be my oh, third year out there. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. It's appropriate we're talking about that now. I believe this is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. So oh, it is. There's, That's right. If mm-hmm. there's any fundraising that you're planning on doing during that, let us know. We'd love to yeah. kind of rally behind you guys yeah. for that. I know Komen is not very popular with a lot of survivors mm-hmm. of breast cancer. Mm-hmm. So the Donna Foundation that we it's would love wonderful. to- It's wonderful. Really yeah. I did yeah. totally big, rally people behind that. Yeah. I did a big fundraiser with them last year. I had a goal to raise $10,000, but I'm not- <sighs> fundraising this year, but I'm 
always spreading awareness for them because I think that they're, I think that I love, like you're saying, like, I love that they're a smaller organization. You can really see more so where their dollars are going. And, um, I've gotten to know the founder who is a three time breast cancer survivor herself. And so, um, yeah, I'm not doing the fundraiser this year. I probably will again last year. I have a feeling the second year in a row might be really challenging. I was like, it's a lot of work for you. It's yeah. a lot. I mean, and it's, it's exciting and I love it. Um, but my big goal will be to just get as many people as possible to sign up and come down for the race because it's a really good race too. I mean, aside from what it's raising money for, it's a well put on fun weekend. Oh, that's amazing. Ooh. Yeah. Good to know. Yeah, I have, I used to do my, my mom had breast cancer. She actually, uh, she had breast cancer twice and she died of breast cancer when I was 13. And so that we, we did a lot of Komen walks, Mm -hmm. um, when she, you know, when I was a younger kid and we did them together and Komen, yeah, is is not, not especially popular, especially in like the Boston medical community. There's, there's been a lot of, Mm -hmm. you know, um, a lot more scrutiny of them. And so I haven't, wanted to do one of those in a long time. But at the same time, there is a part of me that really wants to like sort of reconnect to, um, yeah. you know, running, running for, for breast cancer research and, and doing some kind of fundraising. So that's, that's actually really good to know about that race. I'm going to, I'm going to think but, about that. And yeah. If you ever want me to connect you with them either there, I, I just mm-hmm. love, I love what they're doing. I get to go to their, um, they do like a dinner the night or two before the race and you get to hear from people who have benefited from their services and it's just, it's good. I love it. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Oh yeah. Thank you for that. That's great. Well, is there anything else? I feel like we've gone over. Is there anything else that you definitely wanted to get in Sarah or that we've missed? I wanted to be respectful of your time and we're just, I just can't believe you talked to us at all, much less for this long. Oh, please. I know. Seriously. You are so, so lovely. I can't, Mm -hmm. I can't say that enough. It's always stressful for me to kind of come. I mean, who the FMI was like some housewife that decided like to kind of bust into this industry. I never saw this coming either. And I really dig it. But sometimes when I'm talking to like the coachy coaches, Mm -hmm. um, they say, don't meet your idols. I don't really want to meet any of mine ever Mm -hmm. again. I had a year where I got to meet a bunch of them and it was terrible. Yeah. So (laughs) whenever I do meet someone who I'm like, no, I respect what she does and it works really cool. And oh my God, Sarah, okay, you do the talking. I'm just going to sit there. (laughs) It says like you, it, you were just so such a breath of fresh air and so lovely. And even though I'm 41, I still get like, I've been, I've been around <laughs> and I'm, you know, I've had enough, like things go wrong that I get nervous to go into certain situations again, but God, this is worth it. You are absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank no, you. Thank, thank you, you so guys. Much. And thanks for the authentic conversation and just, you know, making it not just about that picture, but like, what more can we talk about about that? So I appreciate you guys bringing the conversation to the table. Yay. Thank you so much for, for being with us. This has been really fun. Thank you, oh you so much, guys. Lindsay.